Good morning. Hello, and welcome to this program of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs on how the world views U.S. democracy. I think this is really an exercise in ourselves as others see us. Our guests today are four foreign correspondents based in Washington. These are the people whose job it is to describe the United States to the rest of the world. So our question today is, what are they saying about us? My name is Richard Longworth. I'm a fellow here at the Chicago Council, but before that I was a foreign correspondent myself for 20 years for the Chicago Tribune and United Press International. So we may be taking talking a little shop talk here today on how our guests paint the picture that the world sees. Before we get started, please note that the Council is an independent and nonpartisan organization and takes no institutional policy positions. Views expressed by participants on the program are their own. Now, if you have a question you'd like to ask the panel, we'll be taking audience questions in about 30 minutes or so at ccga.live. Uh, simply enter ccga.live into your browser. Follow the on-screen prompt, and you'll be able to submit or vote for your favorite question here. With that said, I'd like to welcome our panel of foreign correspondents to the conversation. Nadia Bilbasi Charters is the Washington Bureau Chief of Al Arabiya and has been in Washington since 2003. Lalit Keja is the Chief U.S. Correspondent for the Press Trust of India, and he's been based in Washington since 2009. Cecilia Kavar is the U.S. correspondent for Swedish Public Radio, reporting from Washington since August. Larry Madowa is the North American correspondent for BBC World News and formerly served as the BBC Africa business editor. Welcome all and thank you for joining us. I think the first question here, I mean, there, there are so many things that Americans themselves don't understand yet the whole Trump era, Trumpism, QAnon, the conspiracy culture, especially the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. How do you explain all of this in this country to your readers? Uh, Lalit, how, how do you handle this? Yeah, uh, reporting for the world's largest democracy about the world's oldest and most powerful democracy is a bit interesting. Uh, you know, we have some kind of familiarity of how democracy works and functions um, in multi-ethnic, multicultural society. But uh, we, uh, over the years, the U.S. has created an image for itself, a very high standards uh, uh, barometer for all the parameters of democracy. And, uh, and we have to explain to our audience back home, leadership back home, how it is functioning, the various aspects of it. Uh, we have a parliamentary system here, it's a presidential system. So all these things we have to keep on explaining them. And, and a lot of people in our, our readers, our audience ask us, why this is happening in the US? We never expected these things to happen. We have to explain all those things there. Uh, Cecilia, how, how do you cope with this? I think Swedes, one of the- Swedes aren't, Swedes aren't used to having coups in Stockholm. Definitely not. Um, and I think one of the words that I've been using the most, uh, not just since August, since I moved here, but since covering the United States from back home as well, uh, since uh, the beginning of 2016 is, polarization and maybe you need the other um, guests on the panel can recognize this as well because I think it's one of the defining features of um, America right now and um, so I think I've been viewing everything that's been happening the past few months through that same lens I guess and try to explain uh, to the audience the listeners at home since I'm a radio reporter about um, how the United States got here, or or uh, why this um, why this division exists? That it's not something new to the United States either, but also through really trying to talk to people and to meet people and to travel as much as I can and and just let um, different people from different parts of this country and from different. Um, parts of life in this country and just listen to them uh, basically and and let the audience back home hear different points of view i think that's been important larry you've your bbc world news you've got a much broader audience how, how do you go about um explaining what's been happening in this country to um uh people around the world 
All right, so Richard, I see my job as translating America to the rest of the world, even though I report in English from an English-speaking nation to the English-speaking world, because this country is one of such huge contradictions. For instance, the world's largest democracy or the world's oldest democracy, which also has this decidedly undemocratic attempt to overturn the will of millions of people who voted for a presidential candidate, and how that can be weaponized to the extent that people who are high on misinformation attempt to attack the nation's parliament and to hang the nation's vice president. I think the word that I have overused this past few weeks and this past few months is unprecedented. I need new words to describe all of the things that we've been seeing. You know the old Lenin quote that there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks when decades happen. It has felt like that, especially this past few weeks. So you've been watching history being made. In, in insane amounts of history being made in such a short period of time that it's almost, it's a fire hose of news that you have to sift and select what is important, what does our audience need to know, and not every five minutes there is something new. And this is even after the tweets went away. There's just been still so much beyond the tweets. And don't, get, don't even get me started on the tweets. Nadia, we're so used to looking at, at instability in the Arab world. Now, how, how, do you, how do you explain instability here to your audience back home? Um, under uh, normal circumstances, uh, there is a huge interest uh, from the Arab world in the United States because all the decisions that's been taken from here affects people in the Arab world, whether it is in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, in Israel, Palestine, in Iran. So it's always an in immense interest. Now, during the Trump administration, I will say this interest became a fascination by this outsider who, who came from outside the establishment, and he uh, it, it changed America in a way. Uh, we leave this to the historians to judge it. But the last uh, few uh, weeks or months, actually, after the election of the administra previous administration was uh, a focus for us. So, I mean, for example, many of the uh, people who I interacted with uh, they tell me this, the United States had to stop lecturing uh, the Arab world about democracy. So unfortunately, I think dictators and authoritarian regimes will look to the United States and said, look, if somebody can de deny the election and till the last minute, despite there was no proof that we found as reporters of uh, uh, misconduct or that the results were actually was not legitimate and the Supreme Court has validated that and the federal courts has said to the same, um, then it was really uh, a, an interesting point. Uh, the day of January 6th, I think, has changed the United States uh, kind of psyche for, uh, for a while, I think, and it will, be, it will leave uh, a, a very important uh, a focus point for many people to debate. Some will compare it to the aftermath of 9-11, some compare it to the days of the civil war. But for me, as a, a reporter, I was just basically on the streets of the capital reporting a normal day supposed to have a uh, pro-president uh, or a pro-Republican party dem demonstrations saying that basically the, the election was stolen. And suddenly we uh, witness history in the making in the worst possible way, when we see people basically uh, want to change uh, to the outcome of the election uh, by force, by violence, and it could have been even worse. So that was a shocking moment for the whole Arab world. And I think it will have a while before we can fix this image about the United States, that it is the, the shining uh, you know, path on, uh, and, and it is a, a beacon of democracy and it can give the Arab world and tell them that you know, uh, we went to Iraq to, to topple a, a dictator and we are here to help you uh, to become a democracy. And in the heart of the democracy, in the symbolism of democracy, with, which is the US capital, it was under attack. It was a very sad, I think, day for uh, democracy in America and a very bad day for uh, America, for the rest of the world, especially in the Arab world. Now we've now we've come to a change. I think <clears throat> we remember back in 2008, after George Bush, Barack Obama was treated around the world almost as a second coming. 
Do you sense that the world is treating Biden's arrival the same way? And how are you, how are you handling this? How are you trying to put some perspective and possibly uh, damping down against over-optimism? Cecilia, how are, you, how are you doing this? Um, yeah, I'm not sure it's viewed the same way in Sweden mm. um, with Biden as, as with Barack o Obama. I can agree that kind of uh, that historic moment of the first black president here, that it was a, a big moment in Sweden too. And a lot of, a lot of Swedes uh, really was fascinated by that and, and, and yeah, and was very interested in following him. And he was a popular American president in Sweden. Uh, but um, I don't think it's, it's, it's viewed the same with Biden in Sweden. And I think it's not viewed the same with Biden here in America either. Uh, a lot of the, the voters that I, I've been talking to the past few months, you know, I, and I guess you can all maybe recognize this as well, have, I mean, everyone was just mostly, the ones that vo voted for Biden mostly voted not for Trump than for Biden. So, and I think in Sweden, people maybe view Biden a little bit the same way in general, uh, because in Sweden, Donald Trump wasn't very popular. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I wouldn't say it's it's the same thing, but I would say that in, in Sweden in general, people are uh, happy that Donald Trump is gone. And uh, we've seen polling uh, in Sweden, um, uh, at least earlier during his presidency of his uh, impopularity. So um, yeah, but I, I wouldn't say it's the same thing as with Barack Obama, no. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you uh, report the news on the scene, but you also re respond to uh, pressures from home, particularly, as I know, from editors. And I'm just wondering, uh, uh, Lalit, what, what kind of American stories most interest, interest your readers, or more to the point, what kind of stories are your editors asking you for? Before I come to that, I'd like to say about what happened between November 3rd and January 6th and today now. It means uh, when India got independent in independence in 1947, several dozens of other countries um, opted for democracy. And now today, you'll see only few few of them are left over there. What over these last three, four months, what you have seen are in, uh, also a sense of maturity and the deep deepness uh, in which the democracy is rooted in this country, right? On January 28th, we have seen, uh, now it's calming situation, everything is back to normal. Uh, on, on January 6th and before that, even one section of the democracy was not behaving well, but other sections, other parts of the democracy all acted together, all pulled in their resources, showed their sense of maturity, which you don't see normally in other parts of the world. It means India could be an exception, but other parts of the world you'll see elections happen, uh, the ruling party doesn't recognize it, and they go on to capture the elections, right? They go on to continue their power, hold on power. This hasn't happened in, in the US. And this, all these kinds shows some le level of maturity over here. Now, coming back to the question that uh, my editors ask and uh, feedback that I get from, uh, get from India kind of stories, uh, the biggest questions about is about US foreign policy, uh, uh, how the system in the US works inside the democratic system works over here. And other questions is about uh, which Indians are, we are all fascinated about H-1B visa, uh, US policies towards China, Pakistan, all these issues we come across. So. Larry, what, do you, what are your editors asking for? So because we have such a wide audience, one of it is the British um, our editors that are interested in the relationship, the special relationship uh, between the UK and the US and uh, whether President Biden is open to a trade deal with the UK, which is, as you know, post Brexit is so important to them and any positive noises he will make in that direction. But globally, there was always an insane amount of interest in Trump and the tweets and the drama and the name calling and all of that. And he just never stopped. But I'm originally from Kenya, and uh, President Obama was hugely popular in Kenya for obvious reasons. When he became president, we actually got a holiday to celebrate. And so Joe Biden was well known in, in Kenya because he was this um, older white man who agreed to be second fiddle to a Kenyan American. But what's been happening is that President Trump had a lot of support from Africa, especially because of the influence of Christian evangelicals, American evangelicalism, and um, televangelists um, go quite far in Africa. And because of President Trump's um, stance against abortion and LGBT rights, he was very popular within certain circles in Africa. 
And what then happened is in the last few weeks of his presidency, as the misinformation hit fever pitch, and there's still a lot of people who tweet me today, Africans who watch my output and they're like, no, but you know, President Trump actually won. The Democrats just stole it from him. And this is how far this has spread beyond the Beltway and beyond uh, the QAnon uh, message boards and all of these conspiracy echo chambers in the US to the other side of the world that there's still a lot of people who believe that. And so even though they knew Biden as President Obama's former vice president, there's still a lot of people who are shedding tears for um, the end of President Trump's presidency. And yet that is also contrasted against President Trump's biggest damage to American image abroad, especially in Africa, is that dictators and authoritarians have been emboldened by America's democratic backsliding. And America has lost the moral authority to lecture Africans on democracy. That's what I'm hearing repeatedly. And it happened gradually over the last four years and then all at, all at once in the last few weeks of President Trump's um, administration. And that is going to be long lasting. It's going to take a while to try and bring that back. And I think that's something that's certainly um, important to point out. That's very important. But Lalit did make the point <clears throat> that um, in the end, the system held, the institutions uh, of democracy held. Um, Nadia, are you are you reporting on that? How how are you handling that? It uh, and the importance of these institutions. Actually, I wanted first of all to to echo what Larry said um, about the message of uh, disinformation. I think President Trump has been very successful uh, in convincing a huge amount of people in, abroad, especially in the Middle East that actually he won this election. Until now, I received sometimes nasty messages to say that I'm a pro-Democrat because I'm not reporting the truth. And actually the truth is President Trump has won this election. This, and again, for over, different reasons. You're, get, you're getting this feedback from overseas, the same. Oh, absolutely. Thing. Yes, they, I'm still getting messages sometimes from people to say, that I am, uh, I'm telling them uh, lies because actually President Trump is winning. And some people still now believe he's gonna come back. And actually this term of uh, President Biden is very short and temporary. So this is what I'm saying that the message that has been uh, going across from the White House uh, via Twitter to the Middle East has worked to a certain extent. Now, he was very popular in a few countries in the Middle East for different reasons than Larry cited. For us, it was Iran. He was seen as a tough man who can stand up to Iran. Um, and Iran basically has been interfering in four Arab, uh, the affairs of four Arab countries, which is Iraq and Lebanon and Yemen, uh, as you know, and, and supporting the Syrian regime. So for, he, for them, he was a hero actually. Um, and then also when he stood up against Europeans and telling NATO to pay more of their dues. So it made him very popular. And the fact that he was not a politician and he will say whatever he comes to his mind, that was very refreshing for them. So in a way, this message has sunk and people actually believe that the president is right and actually everybody else is wrong. Even the Supreme Court is wrong. So from that perspective, I think for us, because we report on every single event that's happened during the day, you ask my colleagues what our editors want, they don't have to ask us. If the president speak for any issue, we will take him live. You will look at the screens. I have five or six screens in front of me. You will see the president, whether it's Trump or now Biden, speaking on, on CNN, on Fox, on MSNBC, on Arabia, and on BBC even, we take him more than uh, other American network. So the Arab world is very familiar with every single detail of American political life, whether it is the, what happened last week, two weeks ago, the attack on the Capitol, what happened with the president refusing to concede and refusing to accept what we call a peaceful transition to power. And that definitely will give weight to people who say uh, the US have zero moral uh, legs to stand on, and basically they stop lecturing us. But they are interested in everything that the United States is doing, and we cannot feed the the beast enough of American news daily. That's fascinating. What what I'm hearing, um, we we hear so much about the decline in American power, that America's role in the world is diminishing, that other powers are rising to challenges. But there seems to be, Nadia, from what you say, there is this. Um, 
utter fascination around the world with what's going on in the United States. Cecilia, I mean, do you, do you, do you find the same thing in Europe? Definitely. And I think it's been so interesting to listen to to my colleagues here. Uh, definitely, um, America is hugely important in Sweden, in Scandinavia, and in, in Northern Europe, and in, in, in Europe in general, like everything that happens here. Uh, the audience follow very closely. I, um, I, I was a producer and, 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 and a co-founder of a, a podcast about American politics in Sweden. And actually last week we were the inauguration week. We were the third most listened podcast in Sweden of all categories. That's like entertainment, everything that says a lot about the interests in it, interest in American politics from the Swedish audience. But in with regards to the views of Trump, something's really re, something really interesting has been happening in Sweden uh, after uh, the uh, the attack on the Capitol, actually, because. Four years ago, when Trump won the election, 2016, there was a big debate in Sweden about uh, why didn't we see this coming? Were the journalists that were covering America, did they not go out uh, on the countryside enough? Did they not listen to you know, the white working class? Why didn't they report enough uh, on what was going on? I know it's, it was the same discussion here in America as well, and maybe in other countries too. But what's happening now, what's happened now since the, the riots, um, I've gotten, there's been a debate in Sweden about have the journalists covering the United States, the correspondents, been too listened too much to Trump supporters, uh, listen too much to Trump, have, especially with my, our sister network, the Swedish um, National Tele Television, they have been, it's been a big national debate in Sweden about their coverage. Have they been talking too much to Trump supporters and not questioning their beliefs enough? Not like if they, they had a Trump supporter on for six minutes talking about how the election was stolen, should they have not done that? And uh, on our inauguration broadcast, I was speaking live to um, a Trump supporter who was here January 6th and who, who kept saying the election was stolen. And I think I questioned, I, 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 I corrected him, if you will, like three times. And I said, yeah, we know there's no uh, real evidence for that. The courts have, yeah, you know, that whole dance that I guess you all have to do as well. Uh, but I still got emails afterwards from, from Swedes that said, how could you even let this person speak? How could you let this, this, this person's views been, been, been heard in, in, in the Swedish radio? Uh, enough of Trump. So there's been this now that we've been covering Trump and covering his supporters too much. Uh, so yeah, I think I think that's that's really interesting, and 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 we'll see how the debate will change in, in the coming months. But that's where we are right now. It's very interesting. There is this, as you know, terrific soul searching among American journalists on how they cover the phenomenon, whether they're talking talking with the right people. It's fascinating to hear that the same soul searching is going on for foreign journalists too. It's um, but um, right now, you um, because of COVID, uh, once you're able to travel, will the story keep you in Washington a lot, or will you be able to get out and around the country? Was that a question for me? Sorry, you you disappeared a little bit. No, I, I was asked, I was going to ask uh, Larry, and, and you're and you're uh, uh, okay there. Okay, uh, yeah, so we lost you there for a second. Um, my job, unlike, um, I guess, um, Nadia or Lalit, I don't spend a lot of time covering the Hill or the White House. I'm on the move a lot. Um, in the last few months leading up to the election, I spent a lot of time, especially in red states, so I see the criticism uh, about listening too much, Cecilia, to um, Trump voters and the motivations and all that, and we made a, make an effort to be balanced. But I did spend a lot of time in Georgia and Texas and the Carolinas and Louisiana and Kentucky and whatnot, just trying to get a sense of, um, um, quote, real America and what they're saying. And even during the pandemic, I've continued to do so um, to travel within the country outside of the Beltway so that um, I guess people who live in this, uh, in this city are very alike because of where they work and the things that they're interested in. And we're all watching Twitter obsessively. And the things that people care about here are very different from what people care about out in the country. And I've, I've, I've appreciated that. And I think our, our, our viewers and audiences around the world um, are often surprised by the viewpoints we get out there. Um, I went out to North Dakota, for instance, something completely unrelated to the election. Um, back when North Dakota had the highest mortality rates of COVID in the world and the highest infection rates. 
And I spoke to people who, for instance, told me that I think the, di the disease is completely made up. It's not real. And mm. so I don't need to wear a mask. And people are shocked by that when we explain and we show the numbers to them and then they listen to people, the ordinary people and how they think about it. And they're like, how is it possible that a lot of people around the world grow up with American popular culture? You've seen the movies and you've seen the series and you've seen all of that. And often when you meet actual Americans, sometimes it can be quite surprising and quite discordant with the image you have of the U.S., and I think that's also maybe the most fascinating part of what I do, which is going out there and, and speaking to these people. Uh, Lalit and Nadia, you, you, uh, you've both been uh, in this country, been working from Washington for more than a decade. In that time, tell me, uh, how is, how is it, what's the big change? In the, have you seen this country change? And what so, what would you single out? Um, for me, I think I've seen it uh, changing to start off uh, with the media. It's very polarized. Uh, before you had at least uh, used to listen to certain programs, whether Meet the Press during Tim Russett or um, other programs. Now it just, you cannot watch network the networks anymore. It is all about the, the one person, it's all about the anchor. It's so much of opinion than information. Uh, so you, you're trying to opt to look for information elsewhere, really. Uh, tell the newspapers as better source than uh, television or broadcast media. I think the broadcast media has become one-sided, whether it is pro this party or that party. It doesn't give you what you need. Uh, culturally, the country is divided, definitely. I mean, we do live in a bubble. We talk about the beltway. Definitely, that's the case. Uh, whether you live in the city like Washington, which is cosmopolitan and center of power, whether it's New York or Lo Los Angeles uh, and few other cities, but the rest of the America, people actually are don't know much about it. And I think the divide between rural America and between the rest of America is becoming very uh, in, in sharp focus. And I'll give you an example of the Trump supporters. I have covered three demonstrations on in Washington in the last uh, two months. And if you look at the people who support him, and you, they look to me like, this is not the Americans I know. <laughs> so yes, we often, I mean, we cover the primaries and we've been traveling during the election, but maybe not as much as Larry uh, does or, or other reporters. And therefore you look at these people and you say, you know, they definitely belong to a lower socioeconomic background. And yet uh, this supporter of the president, when he talks about the stock market and, you know, how the uh, Wall Street is doing very well. And you said, how these people relate to this? And you realize that sometimes you just need one person with a powerful message uh, to give to these people. And it, it, it kind of unleashed the genie, as I always use this, uh, this expression. And now we are on the, on the verge of basically seeing uh, the revival of right-wing uh, parties, anti-Semitic, anti-neo-Nazi, anti-immigrants, anti-Muslims, anti-everything, is becoming, I think, the mainstream, or, or try to become the mainstream. At least we have seen them in the last four years, and this is very dangerous. So this is one thing that I have noticed. This huge divide is becoming uh, bigger and bigger, and hopefully it will stay as that. I mean, this country who tolerates is even hate speech. Now we are um, in front of a moral dilemma. Where do you go when a country like Canada is banning the, the proud boys? Will the US follow suit? And where this group are gonna go? Are they gonna go underground in the absence of somebody like President Trump that's no longer on the scene and has a bigger mega voice through Twitter or through his seat in the White House? Lalit, uh, what, what changes have you seen? You've been here, well, almost 20 years now. What, what changes have you seen in this country in all that time, or the big change? Uh, I know it's, uh, the country is now much more polarized than it was ever in the past, in the last several decades. And I see a lot of familiarity in India as well. As Nadia said about the polarization of media, uh, either you uh, one way or the other side, same is happening in, in India too, right? So maybe it's a phenomena which is common factor becoming in, among bigger, larger democracies where, uh, and I also see the level of tolerance or, uh, or accepting someone or listening to someone other's view which you don't agree with 
is is diminishing every every passing day means the moment you don't tolerate or don't agree with someone's views you you are immediately branded you are you are your image is tarnished by other by other sides this is this is quite dangerous uh, which is uh, which needs to be taken care of other changes means uh, us Uh, from the world perspective the world or the countries other outside the us doesn't see us united states as much powerful as it was um, about a decades ago or about 10 10 years ago uh, there are other pillars other strong pillars emerging in the world china is another another one of them so uh, it is is now facing competition the united states which was a superpower Till, uh, till a decade ago, is now facing a tough competition from uh, from China at least or other other regional players, these are blocks. Uh, when it comes to giving aids, people look at both US and China. They they weigh together, which is giving us more benefit to us. So that is one big change. I'm I'm looking at it right. Um, let, let let's throw some of this open to the audience. We're getting uh, questions coming in from the audience. Here's one. Um, how much influence does social media have on the views of the United States versus uh, the kind of the AP or the kind of reporting that you're doing are you finding yourself in competition with social media for the ears and eyes of listeners and viewers back home um Cecilia um that's an interesting question i think so definitely um just um in the way that uh, everyone uh, can get their news from from anywhere i mean an- anyone can could, could could follow president trump you don't have to be a white house reporter to see what the president said for the past few, four years you just have to have a twitter account or uh, so i think in that in that way definitely and i i think i can see that as well in in the type of reactions i get from listeners uh, a little bit like what naja um, and and larry have been explaining people who are uh, who who say they believe as well that the election was rigged because they've seen it on social social media and um, uh, some q and on supporters as well in sweden and things like that so um yeah yeah definitely i mean there's the, the competition from social media a lot of people get their news from there and uh, um uh, you can tell that by in, in in a few different ways but i think that's i mean we are on social media as well the swedish national public radio so i, I think it's also like all the different types of news are on social media and a lot of our listeners only see our news on our Instagram account for example so um it does it's not it's not um good or bad or anything it's just yeah a fact of life i'm wondering how you uh, get your news i mean you do you people do present the united states to the rest of the world what the rest of the world thinks about the united states is very important and you have a great role in shaping that um uh, i would think that the government and various agencies would be open to you would want to give you as much access as possible but i'm wondering if that is true do you have the kind of access to government to congress to the agencies that you would like uh nadia not really i mean the access has been on the receding end i will say in the last uh, few years or more actually um it is for example i mean with president trump i interviewed uh, more or less all the presidents since bush we tried with president trump and i wasn't successful for four years uh trying to get to the white the, the previous white house was very difficult because there was no structure it was a president or few people around him who will make the decision we hope that with this administration it will be different uh but it depends uh for me i was lucky during the bush administration because most of the foreign policy of the united states was really had direct involvement in the middle east whether it was in iraq or syria or lebanon or now i think is the it's is china is the biggest challenge to the to the united states it doesn't mean that the middle east is not a big headache still and there is strategic uh interest uh, but it depends really sometimes it's really hard we have to work very myself i have to work very very hard to secure an interview or to get an off the record or to give us some exclusive information uh still access is uh, <laughs> uh it's it's a it's the most important thing for us and we struggle to uh, to have it and the least knows because uh we established the foreign correspondent of the in the white house for the sole reason of being able to access the officials whether it's in the white house the state department or elsewhere in the us government Uh Lalit uh, on this question of access do you do you feel you get the access you need and again 
How has this changed over the years, if it has? Yeah, look, uh, from the US standards, the high benchmark that the United States have, has for its freedom of press, definitely we have a little bit long way to go. There's some restrictions. Uh, access is becoming quite tough, uh, even though the previous administration, new administration as well. But you know, but if you look at from foreign, foreign journalist perspective, foreign reporters perspective, uh, United States is the best place for a foreign journalist to work. It gives much greater access than the foreign journalists in any country would get, maybe in India or China or European countries or Russia. You see how, how the foreign journalists in China, Russia, and other parts of the world are treated, which uh, don't talk, means you can even talk about the visa. Means you once you go there, you can't come out. Means you get visa for once a year. A lot of chi U.S. journalists in China, you you must be reading a lot of news reports about that. So we are in much better position than. Yeah, rest but we cannot the world. compare to uh, the Chinese or to the Russian, uh, you know, the Communist Party there. So this is the democracy. Right. You can compare it to India, right? right. But not so to China or Russia. Right, that's what I'm saying. Uh, when you compare yourself with the rest of the world, access is a relative phenomena, but in the US, definitely we have a long, we have a bit long way to go. But the access that we get as compared to foreign journalists in other countries here is much, much better. We talked about, we, you, you, held, uh, you helped us create the White House Foreign Press Group and pool during the first term of the Obama administration. Tell us how many countries in the free world would give you access to their leader, a foreign journalist, the leader. During the Trump administration itself, several times you were there in the Oval Office for one and a half hours. I was there covering several of the cabinet meetings for one and a half hours. How many countries, how many foreign journalists in any part of the world would be attending or listening to a cabinet meeting of that particular country. Means we have to give a little bit better uh, grades to the US when it comes to access to foreign journalists. Larry, would you agree with that? Um, I think outside of Washington and uh, these senior officials, at state and local level, I find that people are quite open to speaking to us and to explaining why they're doing the decisions that they make. And that's kind of refreshing because I have worked in other places. I uh, have uh, worked all across Africa. I've um, reported out of Asian Europe, and it's not always the same. There's a certain need to either hide or to be afraid of the press. Maybe part of it is born from uh, malpractice by reporters and journalists. And I have found absolutely, I'm going to have to agree with Lalit that it's so much easier to access government officials here, even at very high levels um, compared to other parts of the country, um, which is fascinating because even though they do generally make an effort to provide information, to avail um, spokespeople and all of that, that's often not even available to the average American sometimes based on which um, echo chamber they exist in. The hyperpolarization that uh, we've been talking about is so extreme that there's people who exist in their alternate uh, echo chambers and are yelling within them and not yelling at each other. And you see that reflected in the, in the, in the fact that you can't often, especially at this point in the environment in the US where people can't even agree on a set of facts over whether the election was stolen or not. And that's going out there. I remember on inauguration day, I met a South African woman who t told me, oh yeah, yeah, President Trump is going to come back. The military is going to take over and mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of arrests, which are all um, QAnon talking points. And this is still widely believed in, um, in certain circles. So even though I think officials are making an attempt to be available as much as possible, uh, but if you watch MSNBC and you only watch MSNBC, there's obviously angles of um, government that you're not accessing. And the same if you watch only Fox or now Newsmax or ONN. So where do you get uh, where do you get your information? That's uh, the television channels, as you say. I only watch Hannity, of course. I only watch uh, Hannity every night. <laughs> do, do, you, do you really? Define, I mean, he, speaking for the president, he is a source of sorts. Do you watch Hannity? Do you watch these guys? I do actually. I do watch Hannity. I watch Tucker. Um, I follow Breitbart. I follow all the right wing kind of outlets because it, it gives you a sense of one half of America. This is the information they're consuming, and I, it's been so instructive for me to be. Um, sometimes I like to say I hate watch Fox News, not because I'm a raging liberal journalist like I'm often accused of on social media, but because it's often quite divorced from the fact. It's usually just p things that are made up. And if you say it fervently enough with high production value, people believe it. It's indoctrination in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one hopes, I mean, we've been talking about how things may be calming down a bit. Trump has been the story, but now you may have time to 
get out of Washington, get around, do other stories that you've been wanting to do. What sort of stories are you planning on doing now? Cecilia, what are you looking, hoping, hoping to do? Oh my gosh, there's so many stories to do <laughs> now that I'm just waiting to do. But I, I, me as a Swedish journalist, I mean, uh, I'm a, from a country of 10 million people. It's very small. Uh, Swedish correspondents normally don't get uh, any access at all, basically, to, to I mean, White House officials or, or things, things like that. But I agree with Larry that sometimes when you go out in the country, you can, you can meet more local representatives uh, much more easily. Um, but yeah, the uh, a lot of the stories uh, that I want to do now, obviously, I, I think I haven't been able to do enough about um, COVID and, and how that affects people here in this country um, and, and the kind of stories that, that we do, the access that we get. And I think what, what's important for, for our audience, since we are not, I'm not a White House reporter uh, that just necessarily, you know, covers uh, the American politics uh, aspect, but it's just that we travel a lot. I think I went to, I think I did 14 trips this fall to 11 different states before the election. And just to, to keep on doing that, keep on talking to people um, is, I think, very important. And now it's going to be it's going to be important to go out and talk to a lot of the people that uh, still believe maybe that Trump is the rightful um, president of this country. Uh, what are they going to do now? But also, obviously, we have a new president who has a new political agenda. He's been pushing through stuff already. And how is that going to affect um, people? How is his climate agenda going to affect people, you know, in the West and, and in Texas and stuff like that? So uh, a lot of things to do, a lot of things to to cover. But I'm a little bit curious um, if, if I can ask a question uh, to the other guys about uh, with regards to, to access and with regards to how you're viewed as a journalist, uh, if you've experienced as well that, that it's sometimes difficult to approach um, uh, different people, it's it can be aggression from both sides. I think both from the extreme left and and from Trump supporters. Obviously, I guess some of you were were there January sixth as well, and uh, I was there when when you know the the, the pictures from the the AP um, equipment that was um, destroyed by the mob. I was I was there and got chased away as well, and I think maybe you saw that too. And and I've never experienced from all the Trump rallies that I've been to and Trump supporters I've met. I've never. Um, you get some hostility from some people and some people don't want to talk to you, but I've never experienced aggression uh, like that. Um, how do you guys feel about um, I mean, that? if I can answer this question, I myself was at the receiving end of the Trump supporters' aggression uh, on, this, on January 6th, actually. Uh, it doesn't matter who you work with. They don't even know I work for an Arabic TV. They always assume I speak Spanish because maybe because of my look. Uh, but I was called uh, um, a prostitute, um, pedophile, uh, paid by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, it was verbal abuse. And some of them were so, I mean, they will come so close to you with no mask. And they start shouting very, very close um, and accuse you of being anti-American, all kinds of things. Uh, so it, it was not pleasant at all, actually. And I was mainly worried, not because of the violence. I mean, I was a war correspondent in Africa. Uh, I, I, you can always think that you can handle some kind of violence. But I think because of COVID, that was the main worries for me, that they were not wearing any masks. I mean, for everybody that we have seen in the capital, very, very few people, you can count them on your hand that they were wearing masks. And my cameraman as well, they will come and say, a woman was carrying a banner and say, real men don't wear masks. So we were worried even if we put our masks, we stand out as being pro uh, liberals or pro democratic party, whatever they label us. So it was really hard. But saying that too, I mean, I was abused by uh, the pro, um, I don't know, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protesters in the summer. Uh, very, uh, I have one famous video actually, when I was going live on TV and a guy and he kept, it said like, I, you media making money out of us. And uh, he was shouting at me again, he was not wearing a mask. Uh, he was using profound language on TV. It was viral, actually, that video. And I was abused by the police because I was got tear, tear gas twice <laughs> during the when they, Lafayette Park in the summer when they trying to uh, evacuate the protesters when the president went to the church. So, I mean, look, I mean, this is the type of work that we do. 
um, and we take it with stride and what, what we cannot do much about it. Uh, but in general, yes, it, the, I agree with you. The only place that was friendly for pro-Trump uh, rally was outside the hospital. I was outside Walter Reed for two days and there was a small group. Maybe they saw me um, and uh, they were kind of friendly. Uh, but the one that I saw on uh, marching in Pennsylvania Avenue were very, very hostile very hostile and they keep saying of course we're fake news you don't report the truth you know go and they're very um very aggressive very aggressive men and women everybody really i mean they were equally offenders this has been fascinating we could go on a lot longer i'm afraid we've reached the end of the public program here uh, but i'd like to thank everybody who tuned in live via zoom and I want to make a reminder that a recording of this conversation will be available for playback on the council's uh, social channels and website shortly. But for now, thanks so much to all four of you. This has been a fascinating conversation. I wish it could go on forever. Thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you.